and a symbolic space are what are violated in war. You don't have a safe human environment and you don't have a symbolic space. It's all concrete and literal. So that's some effort to answer your question. Uh, the thing that, the reason I've been focusing on early trauma is because it appears in later life around broken relationships and things like that. And because I found it helpful to know that this primary defense that can be so intractable and difficult takes form in early, because of early trauma, because the ego's young and immature and becomes a problem later for the person. But I didn't mean to neglect the whole range of, of well, adult trauma. I think that, um, just trying to, I, I felt that I didn't get something on that more about Yeah. Well, good for you. Good for you. Part of completing the wholeness, you see. That was the piece that we'd left out. And, yeah. and where, so you're... Where, sort of where do we go from here? Because you mentioned the continual defense systems that, that we use in everyday life to deal with good things, bad things, whatever. And, um, well, you know, where we go from here is a, is a really big question. You know, one of the things that's problematic in today's world is that our institutions have become defensive systems. And it's, it's, people are less and less tolerant with the slow incremental processes through which the psyche heals in psychotherapy. Uh, in the world I live in now, in north of New York, people can't find a hospital that will give them sanctuary while they heal uh, because of managed care. The bottom line is money nowadays. Um, and insurance is no, no longer paying for real long-term psychiatric care. And so there are no places to get held anymore. So more and more people are, are losing their containers, the human and interhuman containers in which the psyche needs to heal. And this is a tragedy of our common life today. Um, there's more trauma. We've recognized it. but. It's almost as though we're not making space for it. We're not making time for it. We're making medications for it. We'd rather not be bothered. Yeah. That's true and it's not true. I mean, there's a whole movement now within depth psychology and, you know, uh, which many of you are, are linked up with this world that is trying now to make uh, some sort of healing relationship possibilities available to people. Um, yeah. with the unconscious mm -hmm. is developing is is finding what we need to be grounded in our everyday life and opening to relate to dreams to synchronicities to memories that come up and to the the transitions that life brings um, so that that feels like an answer I'd like to give to that wonderful question you hung out there. Where do we go from here? Yeah. Thank you. In the back. Early adolescents or adolescents? Look, we're talking about a spectrum here, right? Um, trauma that happens in adolescence can be devastating. Um, but sometimes, if the person has had a reasonably good, a good enough childhood and latency period, the trauma that happens then will not be as devastating as trauma early on. Um, it depends, the whole trauma spectrum that we're talking about here depends so much on the resources available, both within the person who's been traumatized and more primarily in the environment what are the resources? Can you get this adolescent into a space where somebody can love her and help her 
download everything that she's feeling and 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 has to keep private, you know, uh, because so many kids who carry around a huge lump of traumatic stuff inside them don't have a safe place to to tell it. Uh, and when they find a safe place to tell it, they get huge relief. So it's. You know, we're dealing with a spectrum. Again, what kind of resources can we make available to people? And, and how, do we, uh, how do we try to promote that? So, does that help? Remember, um, we're not talking about psychological damage. We're talking about life-saving psychological defenses. Okay? The only problem with the life-saving psychological defenses that we're describing is that they can tie up so much energy that might otherwise be available for living that they make the person depressed. Um, we don't want to, I mean, damage is not the right image. Okay? Um, a better image would be life energy has, is, is stuck in an eddy in the stream. It can't get out of that eddy. How do we provide resources that will help this person liberate the life energy that wants to flow? Okay? Now, um, we probably all need a break, right? And yet we're all very close to the end here. Shall we push on through, or are there some of you need to take a bathroom break, or push on through? We do a very short break, too, like five minutes. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back. If you remember, I was talking about Jung's essay on the transcendent function, and that part where he sort of introduced creative arts therapies. Let me read this passage to you. Uh, he's describing his work with patients. Um, he says, I therefore took up a dream image or an association of the patients, and with this as a point of departure, set in the task of elaborating or developing his theme by giving free rein to his fantasy. This is Jung describing really sor sort of how he started to work with unconscious material. This, according to individual taste and talent, could be done in any number of ways, dramatic, dialectic, visual, acoustic, or in the form of dancing, painting, drawing, or modeling. Finally, I was able to recognize that in this method, I was witnessing the spontaneous manifestation of an unconscious process, which was merely assisted by the technical ability of the patient, and to which I later gave the name the individuation process. In many cases, this brought a large measure of therapeutic success, which encouraged both myself and the patient to press forward despite the baffling nature of the results. I felt bound to insist that they were baffling, if only to stop myself from framing on the basis of certain theoretical assumptions, interpretations which I felt were not only inadequate, but liable to prejudice the ingenious productions. I mean, here is Jung at his quintessential best, I think, staying out of the way of the psychic healing process. And so it is with the hand that guides the crayon or brush, the foot that executes the dance step, with the eye and the ear, with the word and the thought, a dark impulse is the ultimate arbiter of the pattern, an unconscious a priori, an unconscious a priori precipitates itself into plastic form. Over the whole procedure, there seems to reign a dim foreknowledge, not only of the pattern, but of its meaning. Image and meaning are identical, and as the first takes shape, so the latter becomes clear. The pattern needs no interpretation. It portrays its own meaning. So this is where the psychoanalyst becomes useless, except as a container for the process. Right. 
Now, um, we have two images in this fairy tale that we should talk about um, because I'm sure you had some questions about them. And the first is this peculiar gesture of the wizard who gives the third daughter an egg. Yeah. Why an egg? Well, let's do a little free association about the meaning of an egg. What's an egg? Creative potential. New life. New life. Female. Self-contained. Protected in a shell. Containing its own nourishment. Fragile. Beginning. Okay, excellent. See, we, we could write a symbol dictionary here. <laughs> but let me tell you what the symbol dictionary says. The life principle, now we got that right. Mm -hmm. The undifferentiated totality, potentiality, the germ of creation, the hidden origin and mystery of being, resurrection, hope. The perfect state of unified opposites, alchemically, the great hermetic vase in which the great work is consummated, the vessel of transformation. Chinese, creation, the cosmic egg splits open and the two halves form the earth and sky. And so on. Um, oceanic, in some islands the first man was said to be hatched from a bird's egg. And so on. So, uh, the egg as an example of the primordial potential wholeness in this person is what the wizard gives to her and says, keep this safe, because a great tragedy would come from the loss of it. And she does. She protects this. And in her protecting it somehow is the key for her power over the dark side of the self. It's like if we can hold the wholeness of the psyche we then don't get caught in just the dark side. We need to, to maintain that wholeness. Now, the second um, image that begs for interpretation in this tale is Fitcher's bird. Um, why a bird? And what is this bird? Any thoughts on that? Bird soars, okay, it goes up, vertical dimension, it soars, transcends the earthly gravity. That's what birds do. Self-creation? Self-created phoenix, the phoenix rising from the ashes, okay? Life after the catastrophe, right? Spirit, yep, spirit. Zeus's bird, the spirit. Freedom. Soul, okay. Good. We got most of it. Here's what the um, symbol dictionary says. Transcendence, ascent to heaven, spirit, divine manifestation, ability to enter into higher states of consciousness, communication with the gods. Fabulous birds depict the celestial realms and the powers opposing the chthonic serpent. Frequently they accompany the hero on his quest, giving him secret advice, like Napoleon's eagle. A little bird told me, symbolizing the help of celestial powers, including angels. Messengers of the gods, the spiritual Christ child often depicted holding a bird. Egyptian, the human-headed bird represents the power of the soul to leave the body at will. The bird Benu incarnates the soul of Osiris and is sometimes equated with the phoenix, the creative principle, producer of the cosmic egg. At death, the soul, the Ka, leaves the body in the shape of a bird, which has the face of the individual, by the way. That's in the Egyptian uh, iconography. 
Hindu intelligence, understanding, he who understands has wings. Shaman, mystic, ascent to heaven, mediumistic and magical journeying, bird robes and feathers worn by shamans in their rites, dressed as a bird, the soul can take wings, and so forth. Um, their absence, the absence of birds is very unfavorable. The entrance to the underworld, called Aorlos, is birdless land by the Greeks. So that's interesting, isn't it? That in the darkness of, of the split off world of Hades, there are no birds. It's the birdless land. Mm. So there's no intermediary spirit that, that makes its ascent and descent. Um, so, Fritcher's bird seems to me to be the natural progression from the egg mm. in our story. Of course, I'm interpreting now, right? Um, and Fritcher's bird is that magical intermediary creature. It's not a bird, it's not a human, it's, it's both a bird and a human. Everybody that meets it on the path talks to it as if it's perfectly understandable what this bird is. It's like yeah. they obey Winnicott, they don't ask it, are you real or imaginal? They just accept it on its own terms. And um, remember, the bird is also a linking thing because it, it's linking the world in which she has been captive in the wizard's magical palace to the world of her homeland and, and her parents. And, but, but she's now decorated in stuff from that magical palace, so she's bringing some of that with her. So we're getting, again, that healing between the real and the, and the imaginal that's part of our story. Okay, um, we're going to have to leave this story with, with its inadequate ending. Kevin, apologies to you. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, fires are, are, are actually uh, one of the major uh, images for transformation. Um, that's certainly true in alchemy. Yes, Mary Pat? There you go. Nice job. <laughs> it's been integrated. <laughs> yeah. Did you have your clients read these and then talk about it as far as the season of them? You know, I don't, um, and sometimes I think I should. The issue of what you have clients read or recommending reading is a whole area that needs to be really discussed and thought about in psychoanalytic theory. Of course, it's a total no-no in conventional psychoanalysis, so we wouldn't even be able to publish this in any of the conventional journals. But I'm interested to find that um, one of my patients, who was a, a deeply wounded uh, as a child, actually the same person that had the screen door slamming that I told you about, uh, <coughs> asked me to give her reading, and I demurred. I, I, I said, no, I, I, you'll find what you need, and so on. But she did find what she needed, but it took her a long time, and what I was impressed with of course, she went and read all the Jungian literature, and then she started calling up the authors. Um, <laughs> mentioning my name. <laughs> so I wish to hell I had given her reading. No, but the, the point was that even though, you know, this was difficult and I had to express my feelings about what was going on and try to police the boundaries a little better somehow. She was aided and helped enormously in the reading she did. And 
not because I helped her with this, but because she needed, she needed to find out other people's descriptions of what she was going through in her therapy. Because she only had mine. And she was so nervous and anxious that she couldn't really ask me during the sessions what I thought about what was happening or how I would frame it or what I would see as going on. She could barely breathe in, the, in, the, in my presence. And we were recovering all this tra these trauma memories. So uh, she couldn't ask me what, how I envisioned the process. So then she started coming to my lectures. And each one of these was a traumatic experience for her. But it was also a huge growth experience for her. And then she did read uh, my writings and eventually probably practically memorized my writings because she knew it better than I did. Uh, but it was, what she read of mine was, was very different from what she read of other people because what she read of mine was almost a way of sort of symbiotically merging with me, whereas what she read of other people she could really make use of. And gradually she came through this process after a long period of, uh, in which she really now could tell me, you know, you really made a terrible mistake when you didn't recommend reading because I benefited a lot and I needed to know what was happening and, I, and you wouldn't tell me. I needed a frame of reference outside what we were doing to help me. So she found that in the, in the literature, and fortunately there's a lot of good literature around, so. I think that um, it's something that has to be dealt with incredibly sensitively by the therapist, because there are people who benefit from that tremendously, and just be sensitive and the timing of it, and for other people I think if the timing is off or whatever, it can feel like a distance. Absolutely, yeah. It can feel like a distance maneuver, yes. You want to give? So much seems resolved in this fairy tale, and yet there's something still left, and that's that there are the three sisters, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering, is that addressed anywhere else? The, um, the role of the, you mean the future of the three sisters, say, or what they mean as a, as a triad? Sorry, I couldn't hear the comment over here, but about um, maybe the integration of that feminine part. Uh huh. Of well, it is a sort of feminine trinity, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought much about that. I, I guess I've thought about it in terms of the universal repetition of the number three in fairy tales. You know, it's always the third uh, sister or the third brother or the third try or the third one thing or another. It's always three. Um, and that in itself is a fascinating thing. You know, Jung always used to say, you know, you have to hold the tension in the paradox until a third is given. And the third is usually the symbol. Um, you know, the, her the third is the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the incarnate Son and the Spirit Father, and then it's the, the third thing is, is what goes back and forth. It's the linking thing. So it's, we, we've privileged thirdness in our general symbolic uh, imagination as a very powerfully important thing. We can't do it with the opposites alone. We have to do it with the third. But that's, that's all I can say about threeness. We have several other hands up here. Let's take this one first. I'd just like to point out that the, the dark of the moon is in three nights. And so the, the, the scripting, the importance of threeness might be programmed into our bodies because of our, uh, the ancient experience of the, the phase of the moon and experiencing that darkness and, and also the story in the Christian uh, uh, Christ was buried for three days which may be a continuation of yeah. that imagery too before the resurrection Jonas was in the belly of the whale for three days it's, it's three is everywhere 
another way to think about the, the three sisters and the two sisters who get cut up first, and then the third one who has, as you described her as wily, but I can also see that as each of the times that she goes into the door and gets cut up, she's gaining experience and gaining knowledge and learning what's going on. Oh, I like that. So that you're taking so by the, the time it happens the third time, she's yeah. gained wisdom. Very good. Gained some insight. Very good. What's going on. Yeah. Nice. Back here. Shadow and the soul. Are we all the same gender? Like for a woman, it isn't her shadow feminine and her? The shadow is usually the same gender as the uh, as the ego. And isn't the soul? I mean, so for the a soul woman, image is the opposite gender. Soul is usually the opposite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Virginia, back here. I've wrestled with the ending of this tale and the related tales to Fitcher's Bird for a long time, and one way I understand it is some tales address just a part of psychological development, and some Mm -hmm. are better individuation tales. They have more completion and more resolution at the Mm -hmm. end, and this Mm -hmm. one feels like a cliffhanger for me. It feels like there's more to be Mm -hmm. done. The original problem was between the... um, the wizard and the wives or the women and so she feels like the next chapter would be finding a way for the t- for the masculine and the feminine to get into a relationship with women. Yeah, that's that's very good. I, um, I think that's absolutely right that uh, uh, when I tried to find fairy tales for my book, um, the four I selected were, were this one and Rapunzel and Eros and Psyche because that's a relatively complete one. Uh, and another one called Prince Lindworm, which is more or less complete. But it's very hard. Most fairy tales, as Virginia is saying, are just little flash pictures of a certain aspect of the process. They don't usually, unless they give you the full picture, so you, you need to look around. Certainly this tale is about this about the relationship between the feminine in its vulnerable and unrealized uh, nature and the masculine in its one-sidedness because the positive side of the masculine does ride in at the end and save her, right? The brothers and the kinsmen Mm -hmm. do come back from the other world and help her in her world of bewitchment and they are are the figures that save the day and so the, the positive masculine does does enter, but only as the horse riding heroes, not as relatedness figures. Yeah. Well, you know, we would need we would need that transformation story to complete uh, this this precipitous ending, wouldn't we? And we don't quite have that here in this this tale. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you all for your contributions, and uh, this has been great for me, and I hope it's been good for you.